I, I think that one of the interesting things about the game of cricket is the choices that cricketers have to make. And, and they may be simple choices like how you score at six and over to win a one-day game or, or how you plot an over that will win a test match like Doug Bracewell did only the other day. Or they may be choices much bigger than that, choices of character and personality and the way you conduct yourself in your life. And, and my feeling about Raul is that he made all the right choices, that if, if you were, if you were, if you like designing somebody to carry the message of the game of cricket in its purest form of playing it and then its form of, of promoting it and being an ambassador for it, you couldn't do it any better than he does. I, I really believe that he's a standout in a modern generation, an exceptional man and clearly an, an exceptional batsman. This is a, a, a guy with over 13,000 test runs, nearly 11,000 one-day runs, 36 test match hundreds, 12 one-day hundreds. It's an astounding record and all of them made with enormous skill but better than that with an enormous amount of humility. Your Bradman oration for 2011 comes from Raul Dravid. Thank you, Mark. Thank you uh, for the really kind words. Uh, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner of, of India, Mrs. Sujata Singh, Chairman of Cricket Australia, Mr. Wally Edwards, the CEO of Cricket Australia, James Sutherland, members of the Indian cricket team, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to deliver the Bradman oration. The respect and the regard that came with the invitation to speak tonight is deeply appreciated. I realize a very distinguished list of gentlemen have preceded me in the 10 years that the Bradman oration has been held. <coughs> I know that this oration is held every year to appreciate the life and career of Sir Don Bradman, a great Australian and a great cricketer. I understand I'm supposed to speak about cricket and issues in the game, and I will. Yet first, before all else, I must say I find myself humbled by the venue we find ourselves in. Even though there is neither a pitch in sight, nor stumps, bat and balls, as a cricketer, I feel I stand on very sacred ground tonight. When I was told I would be speaking at the National War Memorial, I thought of how often and how meaninglessly the words war, battle, fight are used to describe cricket matches. Yes, we cricketers devote a better part of our adult lives to being prepared to perform for our countries, to persist and compete as intensely as we can, and more. This building, however, recognizes the men and women who lived out the words war, battle, fight, for real, and then gave it all up for their country. Their lives left incomplete, futures extinguished. The people of both our countries <coughs> are often told that cricket is the one thing that brings Indians and Australians together, that cricket is our single common denominator. India's first test series as a free country was played against Australia in November 1947, three months after our independence. Yet the histories of our countries are linked together far more deeply than we think, and further back in time than 1947. We share something else other than cricket. Before they played their first test match against each other, Indians and Australians fought wars together on the same side. In Gallipoli, where along with thousands of Australians, over 1,300 Indians also lost their lives. In World War II, there were Indian and Australian soldiers in El Alamein, North Africa, in Syria-Lebanon campaign, in Burma, in the Battle of Singapore. Before we were competitors, Indians and Australians were comrades. So it is only appropriate that we are here this evening at the Australian War Memorial, where along with celebrating cricket and cricketers, we remember the unknown soldiers of both nations. It is, however, incongruous that I, an Indian, happen to be the first cricketer from outside Australia invited to deliver the Bradman oration. I don't say that because Sir Don once scored 100 before lunch at Lord's, and my 100 this year at Lord's took, uh, well, almost an entire day. <laughs> but, but more seriously, Sir Don played just five tests against India. That was in the first India-Australia series in 1947-48, which was to be his last season at home. He didn't even play in India, and remains the most venerated cricketer in India not to have played there. We know that he set foot in India, though, in May 1953, when on his way to England to report on the ashes for an English newspaper, his plane stopped in Kolkata airport. 
there were said to be close to a thousand people waiting to greet him. As you know, he was a very private person and so got into an army jeep and rushed into a barricaded building, annoyed with the airline for having breached confidentiality. That was all Indians of the time saw of Bradman, who remains a mythical figure. For one generation of fans in my country, those who grew up in the 1930s, when India was still under British rule, Bradman represented a cricketing excellence that belonged to somewhere outside England. To a country taking its first steps in test cricket, that meant something. His success against England at that time was thought of as our personal success. He was striking one for all of us ruled by the common enemy, or as your country has so poetically called them, the palms. <laughs> there are two stories that I thought I should bring to your notice. On June 28, 1930, the day Bradman scored 254 at Lords against England, was also the day Jawaharlal Nehru was arrested by the police. Nehru was, at the time, one of the most prominent leaders of the Indian independence movement, and later independent India's first prime minister. The coincidence of the two events was noted by a young boy, K. N. Prabhu, who was both nationalist, cricket fan, and later became independent India's foremost cricket writer. In the 30s, as Nehru went in and out of jail, Bradman went after the England bowling, and for K. N. Prabhu, became a kind of avenging angel. There's another story I've heard about the day in 1933, when the news reached India that Bradman's record for the highest test score of 334 had been broken by Wally, Wally Hammond. As much as we love our records, they say some Indian fans at the time were not exactly happy. <laughs> now there's a tale that a few even wanted to wear black bands to mourn the fact that this precious record that belonged to Australia, and by extension us, had gone back to an Englishman. We will never know if this is true, if black bands were ever worn. But as journalists tell me, why let facts get in the way of a good story? <laughs> My own link with Bradman was much like that of most other Indians, through history books, some old video footage, and his wise words. About leaving the game better than you found it, about playing it positively, as Bradman, then a selector, told Richie Benno before the 1960-61 West Indies tour of Australia. Of sending a right message out from cricket to its public, of players being temporary trustees of a great game. While there may be very little similarity in our records, or our strike rates, or our fielding, I can say this only today in front of all of you. I am actually pleased that I share something very important with Sir Don. He was primarily, like me, a number three batsman. We are the ones who make life easier for the kings of batting, the, the middle order that, that follows us. <laughs> Bradman, Bradman did that with a, with a bit more success and style than, than I did. He dominated bowling attacks and, and put bums on seats. If I bat for any length of time, and I'm warning Cricket Australia, that I'm more likely to bore people to sleep. <laughs> Still, it's nice to have batted for a long time in a position whose benchmark is, in fact, the benchmark for batsmanship itself. Before he retired from public life in his 80s, I do know that Bradman watched Sunil Gavaskar's generation play series in Australia. I remember the excitement that went through Indian cricket when we heard the news that Bradman had seen Sachin Tendulkar bat on TV and thought he batted like him. It was more than mere approval. It was as if the great dawn had passed on his torch, not to an Aussie or an Englishman or a West Indian, but to one of our own. One of the things Bradman said has stayed in my mind, that the finest of athletes had along with skill a few more essential qualities to conduct their life with dignity with integrity, with courage, and modesty. All this, he believed, were totally compatible with pride, ambition, determination, and competitiveness. Maybe those words should be put up in cricket dressing rooms all over the world. As all of you know, Don Bradman passed away on February 25, 2001, two days before the India versus Australia series was to begin in Mumbai. Whenever an important figure in cricket leaves us, Cricket's global community pauses in the midst of contests and debates to remember what he represented of us, what he stood for, and Bradman was the pinnacle, the standard against which all test batsmen must take guard. The series that followed two days after Bradman's death later went on to become what many believe was one of the greatest in cricket. It is a series I'd like to believe he would have enjoyed following. A fierce contest between bat and ball went down to the final session of the final day of the final test. 
between an Australian team who had risen to their most imposing powers and a young Indian team <coughs> determined to rewrite some chapters of its own history. The 2001 series contained high quality cricket from both sides and had a deep impact on the careers of those who played a part in it. The Australians were near unbeatable in the first half of the new decade, both at home and away. As others floundered against them, India became the only team which competed, which competed with them on even terms. India kept answering questions put to them by the Australians and asking a few themselves. The quality demanded of those contests, sometimes acrimonious, sometimes uplifting, made us, the Indian team, grow and rise. As individuals, we were asked to play to the absolute outer limit of our capabilities, and we often extended them. Now, whenever India and Australia meet, there is an expectation and anticipation. As we get into the next two months of the Border Gavaskar Trophy, players on both sides will want to deliver their best. When we toured in 2007-8, I thought it was going to be my last tour of Australia. The Australians thought it was, the, it was going to be the last time they would be seeing Sachin Tendulkar on their shows. He received warm standing ovations from wonderful crowds all around the country. Well, like a few creaking terminators, we are back. <laughs> Older, wiser, and I hope improved. The Australian public will want to stand up to send Sachin off all over, all over again this time. But I must warn you, given how he's been playing these days, there are no guarantees about final goodbyes. In all seriousness, though, the cricket world is going to stop and watch Australia and India. It is Australia's first chance to defend their supremacy at home, following defeat in the 2010 Ashes and a drawn series against New Zealand. It is India's opportunity to prove that the defeat in England in the summer was an aberration that we will bounce back from. If both teams look back on their 2007-8 series in Australia, they will know that they should have done things <coughs> a little differently in the Sydney Test. But I think both sides have moved on from there. We've played each other twice in India already, and relationships between the teams is much better, is, is much better than they have been as far as I can remember. Thanks to the IPL, Indians and Australians have shared dressing rooms. Shane Watson's involvement in Rajasthan, Mike Hussey's role with Chennai, to mention a few, are deeply appreciated back home. And even Shane Warne likes India now. <laughs> I, I, really enjoyed playing, I really enjoyed playing alongside him at Rajasthan last season and can confidently report to you he's not eating imported baked beans anymore. <laughs> Actually, in fact, looking at him the other day, it seems he's not eating anything. It's, it's, it, is often said that cricketers, it is often said that the cricketers are ambassadors for their country. When there's a match to be won, sometimes we think that, there is an un, that it is an unreasonable demand. After all, what would career diplomats do if the result of a test series, say, depended on them walking? But as, but as ties between India and Australia strengthen, and our contests have become more frequent, we realize that as Indian players, we stand for a vast, varied, often unfathomable and endlessly fascinating country. At the moment, to much of the outside world, Indian cricket represents only two things, money and power. Yes, that aspect of Indian cricket is a part of the whole, but, is not, but it is not the complete picture. As a player, as a proud and privileged member of the Indian cricket team, I want to say, I want to say that this one-dimensional, often cliched image, relentlessly repeated, is not what Indian cricket is really about. I cannot take all of you into the towns and villages our players come from and introduce you to their families, teachers, coaches, mentors and teammates who made them international cricketers. I cannot take all of you here to India to show you the belief, struggle, effort and sacrifice from hundreds of people that runs through our game. As I stand here today, it is important for me to bring Indian cricket and its own remarkable story to you. I believe it is very necessary that cricketing nations try to find out about each other, try to understand each other and the different role cricket plays in different countries, because ours is eventually a very small world. Indian cricket is buzzing, humming, living entity, going through a most remarkable time like no other in our cricketing history. In this last decade, the Indian team represents more than ever before the country we come from, of people from vastly different cultures, who speak different languages, 
follow different religions, belong to all classes of society. I went around our dressing room to work out how many languages could be spoken in there, and the number I've arrived at is 15, including Shona and Afrikaans. Most foreign captains, I think, would balk at the idea. But when I led India, I enjoyed it. I marveled at the range of difference and the ability of people from so many different backgrounds to share a dressing room, to accept, to accommodate, and respect that difference. In a world growing more insular, that is a precious quality to acquire. Because it stays with you for life and helps you understand people better, understand the significance of the other. Let me tell you one of my favorite stories from my under-19 days. When the Indian under-19 team played a match against New the New Zealand junior team, we had, two, we had two bowlers in the team, one from the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, and he spoke only Hindi, which is usually a, a link language for, for players from all over India, ahead even of English. It should have been all right, except that the other bowler came from Kerala in the deep south, and he spoke only the state's regional language, Malayalam. Now, even that should have been okay, because they were both bowlers and could bowl simultaneous spells. Yet in one game, they happened to come together at the crease. In the dressing room, we were in splits, <laughs> wondering how they were going to manage the business of a partnership, calling for runs or sharing strike. Neither man could understand a word of what the other was saying, and they were batting together. This could only happen in Indian cricket, except that these two guys came up with a 100-run partnership. Their, com their common language was cricket, and it worked out just fine. The everyday richness of Indian cricket lies right there. Not in the news you hear about million-dollar deals and television rights. When I look back over 25 years I've spent in cricket, I realize two things. First, rather alarmingly, that I'm the oldest man in the game, older <laughs> even to Sachin by three months. But more importantly, I realize that Indian cricket actually reflects our country's own growth story during this time. Cricket is so much a part of our national fabric that in India, its economy, society and popular culture transformed itself, so did our most loved sport. As players, we are appreciative beneficiaries of the financial strength of Indian cricket. But we, are, but we are more than just mascots of that economic power. The caricature often made of Indian cricket and its cricketers in the rest of the world is that we are pampered superstars, overpaid, underworked, treated like a cross between royalty and rock stars. Yes, the Indian team has an em enormous emotional following and we do need security when we get around the country as a group. It is also where we make it a point to always try and conduct ourselves with composure and dignity. On tour, I must point out, we don't attack fans or do drugs or get into drunken theatrics. And at home, despite what some of you may have heard, we don't live in mansions with, with swimming pools. The news about money may well overpower all else. But along with it, our cricket is full of stories the outside world does not see. Television rights generated around Indian cricket are much talked about. Let me tell you what the television around those much sought after rights has done to our game. A sport that was largely played and patronized by princes, businessmen, in traditional urban centers, cities like Bangalore, Bombay, Chennai, Baroda, Hyderabad, Delhi, has, be has begun to pull cricketers from everywhere. As the earnings from Indian cricket have grown in the past two decades, mainly through television, the BCCI has spread the revenues to various pockets in the country. And improved, the, and improved where we play. The field is now spread wider than it has ever been. The ground covered by Indian cricket has shifted. 27 teams compete in our national championship, the Ranji Trophy. Last season, Rajasthan, a state best known for its palaces, fortresses, and tourism, won the title for the first time in its history. The national one-day championship was also won for the first time by Jharkhand, a state from which M.S. Dhoni, our captain, comes. The growth and scale of cricket on our television was the engine of this population shift. Like Bradman was the boy from Baural, a stream of Indian cricketers now come from what you can call India's outback. Zaheer Khan belongs to the Maharashtra heartland, from a town that didn't have even one proper turf wicket. He could have been an instrumentation engineer, but was drawn to cricket through TV and modeled his bowling by practicing in front of the mirror on his cupboard at home, and first bowled with a proper cricket ball at the age of 17. One day out of nowhere, a boy from a village in Gujarat 
turned up as India's fastest bowler. After Munaf Patel made his debut for India, the road from the nearest railway station to his village had to be improved because journalists and TV crews from the cities kept landing up there. <laughs> we are delighted that Umesh Yadav didn't become a policeman like he was planning and turned to cricket instead. He is the first cricketer from the Central Indian first class team of Vidarbha to play test cricket. Virendra Sehwag, and, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, belongs to the Wild West, just outside Delhi. <laughs> he had to be enrolled in a college which had a good cricket program and travel 84 kilometers every day by bus to get to practice and matches. Every player in this room wearing an India blazer has a story like this. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart and soul of Indian cricket. Playing for India completely changes our lives. The game has given us a chance to pay back our debt to all those who gave of their time energy, resources for us to be better cricketers. We can build new homes for our parents, get out siblings married off in style, give our families very comfortable lives. The Indian cricket team is in fact India itself in microcosm. A sport that was played first by princes, then by their subordinates, then the urban elite, is now a sport played by all of India. Cricket, as my two under-19 teammates proved, is India's most widely spoken language. Even Indian cinema has its regional favorites. A movie star in the, south, in the South may not be as popular in the North, but a cricketer loved everywhere. It is also a very tough environment to grow up in. Criticism can be severe. Responses to victory and defeat, extreme. There are invasions of privacy and stones have been thrown at our homes after some defeats. It takes time getting used to. Extreme reactions can fill us with anger. But every cricketer realizes at some stage of his career that the Indian cricket fan is best understood by remembering the sentiment of the majority, not the actions of a minority. One of the things that has always lifted me as a player was looking out of the team bus when we traveled somewhere in India. When people see the Indian bus go by, see some of us sitting with our curtains drawn back, it always amazes me how much they light up. There is an instantaneous smile, directed not just at the player they see, but at the game that we play, that for whatever reason means something to people's lives. Win or lose, the man on the street will smile and give you a wave. After India won the World Cup this year, our players were not congratulated as much as they were thanked by the people they ran into. You have given us everything, they were told. All of us have won. Cricket in India now stands not just for sport, but possibility, hope, opportunity. On our way to the Indian team, we know so many of our teammates, some of whom may have been equally or more talented than those sitting here, who missed out. When I started out for a young Indian, cricket was the ultimate gamble. All or nothing. No safety nets. No second chances for those without an education or a college degree or second careers. Indian cricket's wealth now means a wider pool of well-paid cricketers even at the first class level. For those of us who make it to the Indian team, cricket is not merely our livelihood. It is a gift we have been given. Without the game, we would just be average people leading average lives. As Indian cricketers, our sport has given us the chance to do something worthwhile. How many people could say that? This is the time Indian cricket should be flowering. We are the world champions in the short game and over the space of the next 12 months should be involved in a tight contest with Australia, South Africa, and England to determine which one of us is the world's strongest test team. Yet I believe this is also a time for introspection within our game, not only in India, but also all over the world. We have been given some alerts and responding to them quickly is the smart thing to do. I was surprised a few months ago to see the lack of crowds in a, in a one day series featuring India. By that, by that, I don't mean the lack of full houses. I think it was the sight of empty stands I found somewhat alarming. India played its first one-day international at home in November 1981, when I was nine. Between then and now, India has played 227 ODIs at home. The October five-match series against England was the first time that the grounds had not been full for an ODI featuring the Indian team. In the summer of 1998, I played a one-dayer against Kenya in Kolkata, and Eden Gardens was full. Our next game was held in the 48 degrees heat of Gwalior, and the stands were heaving. The October series against England was the first one at home after India's World Cup win. It was called the Revenge Series, meant to wipe away the memory of a forgettable, forgettable, forget, sorry, 
forgettable tour of England. India kept winning every game, and yet the stands did not fill up. Five days after a 5-0 victory, 95,000 turned up to watch India's first Formula One race. A few weeks later, I played in a test match against the West Indies in Calcutta, in front of what was the lowest turnout in Eden Gardens history. Yes, we still wanted to win, and our intensity did not dip. But at the end of the day, we are performers, entertainers, and we love an audience. The audience amplifies everything you're doing. The bigger the crowd, the bigger the occasion, its magnitude, its emotion. When I think about the Eden Gardens crowd this year, I wonder what the famous Calcutta test of 2001 would have felt like with 50,000 people less watching us. Australia and South Africa played an exciting and thrilling test series recently. Two great test matches produced some fantastic performances from players of both teams, but was played in front of sparse crowds. It's not the numbers test players need, it is the atmosphere of a test that every player wants to revel in and draw energy from. My first reaction to the lack of crowds for cricket was that there had been a lot of cricket and so perhaps a certain amount of spectator fatigue. That is too simplistic a view. It is an easy thing to say, but that might not be the only thing. The India versus England series had no context, because the two countries had just played each other in four tests and five one days just recently. When India and West Indies played ODIs a month after that, the grounds were full. But this time, matches were played in smaller venues that didn't host too much international cricket. Maybe our clues are all there and we must remain vigilant. Unlike Australia or England, Indian cricket has never had to compete with other sports for, for a share of revenues, mind space, or crowd attendance at international matches. The lack of crowds may not directly impact on revenues or how important the sport is to Indians, but we do, but we do need to accept that there has definitely been a change in temperature over, I think, the last two years. Whatever the reasons are, maybe it's too much cricket or too little by way of comfort for spectators. The fan has sent us a message and we must listen. This is not mere sentimentality. Empty stands do not make for good television. Bad television can lead to a fall in ratings. The fall in ratings will be felt by media planners and advertisers looking elsewhere. If that happens, it is hard to see television rights around cricket being as sought after as they have always been in the last 15 years. And where does that leave everyone? I'm not trying to be an economist or a doomsday prophet. This is just how I see it. Let us not be so satisfied with the present, with deals and finances in hand, that we get blindsided. Everything that has given cricket its power and influence in the world of sports has started from the fan in the stadium. They deserve our respect, and let us not take them for granted. Disrespecting fans is disrespecting the game. The fans have stood by our game through everything. When we play, we need to think of them. As players, the balance between competitiveness and fairness can be tough, but it must be found. If we stand for the game's basic decencies, it will be far easier to tackle its bigger dangers. Whether it's finding shortcuts to easy money or being lured by the scourge of spot fixing and contemplating any involvement with the betting industry. Cricket's financial success means it will face threats from outside the game and keep facing them. The last two decades have proved this over and over again. The internet and modern technology may just end up being a step ahead of every anti-corruption regulation in place in the game. As players, the, on the one way we can stay ahead for the game is if we are willing to be monitored and regulated closely, even if it means giving up a little bit of freedom of movement and privacy. If it means undergoing dope tests, let us never say no. If it means undergoing lie detector tests, let us understand the technology, what purpose it serves, and accept it. Now, lie detectors are by no means perfect, but they could actually help the innocent clear their names. Similarly, we should not object to having our finances scrutinized, if that is what is required. When the first anti-corruption measures were put into place, we did moan a little bit about being accredited and depositing our cell phones with the manager. But now, we must treat it like we do, air do an airport security because, as, because we know it is for our own good and our own security. Players should be ready to give up a little bit of personal space and personal comfort for this game which has given us so much. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Other sports have borrowed from cricket's anti-corruption measures to set up their own ethical governance programs and we must take pride in belonging to a sport that is professional and progressive. One of the biggest challenges that the game must respond to today, I believe, 
is charting out a clear roadmap for the three formats. We now realize that sports three formats cannot be played in equal number. That will only throw scheduling and the true development of players completely off gear. There is a place for all three formats though. We are the only sport that I can think of that has three versions. Cricket must treasure this originality. These three versions require different skills. Skills that have evolved, grown, changed over the last four decades. One impacting the other. Test cricket is the gold standard. It is the form the players want to play. The 50 over game is the one that has kept cricket's revenues alive for more than three decades now. 2020 has come upon us and it is the format people, the fans want to see. Cricket must find a middle path. It must scale down this mad merry-go-round the teams and players find themselves in, heading off for two test tours and seven match ODI series and a few 2020s thrown in. Test cricket deserves to be protected. It is what the world's best know they will be judged by. Where I come from, nation versus nation is what got people interested in cricket in the first place. When I hear the news that a country is playing without some of its best players, I always wonder what do their fans think. People may not be able to turn up to watch test cricket, but everyone follows the scores. We may not be able to fill up 65,000 capacity stadiums for test matches, but we must actively fight to get as many as we can in, to create a test match environment that the players and the fans feed off. Anything but the sight of tests played on empty grounds. For that, we've got to play test cricket that people can watch. I don't think day-night tests or a test championship should be dismissed. In March of last year, I played a day-night first-class game for the MCC in Abu Dhabi. And my experience from that was that day-night test is an idea worth exploring. There may be some challenges in places where there is dew, but the visibility and durability of the pink cricket ball was not an issue. Similarly, a test championship where every team and player driving themselves to be winners of a sought-after title seems like it would have context to every game. Keeping tests alive may mean different innovations in different countries, maybe taking it to smaller cities, playing it in grounds with smaller capacities like New Zealand has thought of doing, maybe reviving some old venues in the West Indies like the old recreation ground in Antigua. When I was around seven years old, I remember my father taking a Friday off so that we could watch three days of test cricket together. On occasions he couldn't, I would accompany one of his friends just to soak in a day of test cricket and watch the drama slowly unfold. What we have to do is find a way to ensure that test matches fit into 21st century life through timing, environments, the venue they are held in. I am still convinced that it can be done, <coughs> even in our fast-moving world with a short attention span. We will often get told that test matches don't make financial sense. But no one ever fell in love with test cricket because they wanted to be a businessman. Not everything of value comes at a price. There is a proposal during the rounds about scrapping the 50 over game completely. I'm not sure I agree with that. I certainly know that the 50 over game helped us innovate strokes in our batting, which we were able to take into test matches. We all know that the 50 over game has been responsible for improving fielding standards all over the world. The future may well lie in playing one-day internationals centered around ICC events, like the Champions Trophy and the World Cup. This would ensure that all 50 over matches would build up to those tournaments. That will cut back on the number of one-day internationals played every year, but at least those matches will have a context. Since about, I think, 1985, people have been saying that there's too much meaningless one-day cricket. Maybe it's finally time to do something about it. The 2020 game, as we know, has, give, has as many critics as it has supporters in the public. Given that an acceptable strike rate in T20 these days is about 120, I should probably complain about it the most. <laughs> the, the, crowd, the crowd and revenue numbers, though, tell us that if we do not handle 2020 correctly, we may, we may well have more and more private players stepping in to offer not just slices of pie, but maybe even bigger pies themselves. So I'll reiterate what I've just said very quickly because balancing three formats is important. We have test cricket like we have always had, nation versus nation, but carefully planned to attract crowds and planned fairly so that every test playing country get its, gets its fair share of tests and playing for a championship or a cup, not just some points or a ranking. The 50 overs format focused around fewer significant multi-nation multi ICC events like the Champions Trophy and the World Cup. 
in the four-year cycle between World Cups, plan the one-day calendar and devise rankings around, those, around these few important events. Anything makes more sense than a seven-match, one-day series. The best role for 2020 is a domestic competition through official leagues, which will make it financially attractive for cricketers. That could also keep cricket viable in countries where it fights for space and attention. Because the game is bigger than us all, we must think way ahead of how it stands today. Where do we want, where do we want it to be in the year 2020, or say 2027, when it will be 150 years since the first test match was played? If you think about it, cricket has been with us longer than the modern motor car. It existed before modern air travel took off. As much as cricket's revenues are important to its growth, its traditions and its vibrancy are a necessary part of its progress in the future. We shouldn't let either go because we play too much of one format and too little of the other. Professionalism, professionalism has given cricketers of my generation privileged lives, and we know it. Even though often you, you may hear us whining about burnout, travel, and lack of recovery time. Whenever we begin to get into that mindset, it's good, it's good to remember a piece of Sachin's conversation with Bradman. Sachin told us that he asked Sir Don how he, how he mentally prepared for big, for big games, what his routines were. Sir Don said that, well, before a game, he would go to work, and after the game, he would go back to work. <laughs> Whenever a cricketer feels a winch coming on, that would be good to remember. Before I conclude, I also want to talk briefly about an experience I have of often had over the course of my career. It is, it is not to do with the individuals or incidents, inc incidents, but one I believe is important to share. I have often found myself in the middle of a big game, standing at slip or even at the non-striker's end, and suddenly realize that everything else has vanished. At that moment, all that exists is the contest and the very real sense of joy that comes from playing the game. It is, almost, it, is almost, it is an almost meditative experience where you reconnect with the game just like you did years ago, when, when, when you first began. When you hit your first boundary, took your first catch, scored your first century, or were involved in a big victory. It lasts for a very fleeting passage of time. But it is a very precious instant, and every cricketer should hold on to it. I know it is utterly fanciful to expect professional cricketers to play the game like amateurs. But the trick, I believe, is taking the spirit of the amateur, of discovery, of learning, of pure joy, of playing by the rules into our profession. Taking it to practice or play, even when there's an epidemic of white line fever breaking out all over the field. In every cricketer, there lies a competitor who hates losing. And yes, winning matters. But it is not the only thing that matters when you play cricket. How it is played is as important for every member of every team, because every game we play, leaves a footprint in cricket's history. We must never forget that. What we do as professionals can easily be carried, carried over into the amateur game in every way. Batting, bowling, fielding, appealing, celebration, dissent, argument. In the players of 2027, we will see a reflection of this time and of ourselves. And it, and it had better not annoy us 50-year-olds. As the game's custodians, it's important we are, we are not tempted by the short-term gains of the backward step. We can be remembered for being that generation that, that took the giant stride. Thank you for the invitation to address all of you and for your attention.